1945, after the long blackout, after the long night of war, the lights of London are on again. in six long years, perhaps the most joyous, the most glorious spring in all English history. among the cheering crowds of Londoners in their hour of well-won rejoicing. The tremendous foe they had fought for more than five years had surrendered unconditionally. However, there was another side to the picture. Japan was still unconquered. The atomic bomb was still unborn. common danger which had united the great allies had vanished overnight. The Soviet menace to my eyes had already replaced the Nazi foe. Within a few days of the German surrender, I sent the president what may be called the Iron Curtain Telegram. Of all the public documents I have written on this issue, I would rather be judged by this. I said, I am profoundly concerned about the European situation. Surely it is vital now to come to an understanding with Russia before we weaken our armies mortally. We do not know what is going on behind the Russian front. An iron curtain is drawn down. the foundations of national unity upon which the wartime government had stood so firmly were also gone. From the moment of the German surrender, the public mind turned swiftly from national rejoicing to political party strife. Twenty-third, being confronted by a definite breach between the parties, I tendered my resignation to the king. Mr. Churchill was always basically and fundamentally a House of Commons man. He took the view that no government could hope to carry out its policies effectively unless it could show that it had the full support of the House of Commons. Now this, of course, uh, involved a fairly rigid discipline. And he was prepared, because he believed in the House of Commons and in the way it worked, he was prepared to accept that discipline, whether in war or in peace. During the period prior to the election, 
the king requests Winston Churchill to form a caretaker government. July 5th is established as polling day, but because time is allotted to record the soldier vote from overseas, the election results will not be known until July 26th. Next month was hard to live through. Strenuous motor tours with three or four speeches a day consumed my time and strength. But I was trained in my father's house to believe in democracy. Trust the people, he said. The incongruity of political party excitement and clatter with the somber background which filled my mind was in itself an affront to reality and proportion. All the while, I felt that much we had fought for in our long struggle in Europe was slipping away and that the hopes of an early and lasting peace were receding. I could feel the vast manifestation of Soviet and Russian imperialism rolling forward over helpless lands. What were we to do? In a very short time, our armies would have melted. But the Russians would remain with hundreds of divisions in possession of Europe, from Lübeck on the Baltic in the north to the Greek frontier on the Adriatic. civilian armies of the West were clamoring to go home. hour of triumph and jubilation, dark undercurrents run beneath the surface gaiety. My prime thought was a meeting of the three great powers, and I hoped that President Truman would come. Not everyone in Britain perceives the storm clouds in the eastern sky, for there are many grave problems at home. Problems of housing, and poverty, and of old age and pension. The war shortages are still acute. Shortages of food and of fuel. These are the issues on which the Labour Party hammers away during the election campaign. During the campaigning, Churchill is heckled and booed. Being an old hand at elections since 1899, he knows how to retort. The winners cheer and the beaten boo. I want to talk about London's wonderful war record. Would you like to boo that too? For millions of young British subjects, voting is a new experience. There has been no election since 1935, so it is the first ballot for everybody under 30 years of age.
advised him two days after polling day, I resolved to have a week of sunshine and flew to Bordeaux with Mrs. Churchill and Mary and found myself agreeably installed near the Spanish frontier at Ondai with lovely bathing and beautiful surroundings. In the afternoons, I sallied forth with my elaborate painting outfit and found attractive subjects on the River Neve and the Bay of Saint-Jean-de-Luz. An ardent admirer of Churchill's paintings is Miss Vivian Lee. I've always loved pictures, and I think one of the most wonderful, marvelous experiences of my whole life was when the Winston allowed me to see his. I'd been lunching with him at Chartwell, and after lunch, I remember it was a lovely sunny day, and we were walking around the garden, and we came to a garden house with, I suppose, um, four or five rooms in it, and in each one, the walls were simply covered in his own paintings. And I was astonished and fascinated by the variety and the number of them. But as I was passing one particular one, I said, oh, sir, that is beautiful. And to my absolute bewilderment, he said, would you like it? So actually, I, I, I practically fainted. I, I didn't know what to say, but I believe I gave him to understand that I would be more thrilled and honored that I could possibly say it to have it. So he said he would send it to me for Christmas. However, two weeks later, a marvelous package arrived, and there it was, with a letter which, of course, I shall keep all my life, saying I couldn't wait till Christmas. On the 15th, my sky master took me to Berlin. The city was nothing but a chaos of ruins. The Prime Minister is conducted to Hitler's air raid shelter beneath the shattered walls of the Chancellery. I went down to the bottom and saw the room in which Hitler and his mistress had committed suicide. And when we came up again, they showed us the place where his body had been burned. Ten thousand British and American troops with tanks and other armor move in impressive array down the Charlottenburger Chaussee to the Brandenburg Gate. As Churchill takes the salute, he says, This is the hour I have lived for. <laughs> President Truman arrived in Berlin the same day I did. I was eager to meet a potentate with whom my cordial relations had been established by correspondence. I was impressed with his gay, precise, sparkling manner and obvious power of decision. He was good enough to say how earnestly he hoped the relations I had with President Roosevelt would be continued between him and me. I felt that here was a man of exceptional character and ability, with a great deal of self-confidence and resolution. Potsdam, July 17, 1945. This historic confrontation of the three most powerful men in the world marks the end of the Grand Alliance and the beginning of the Cold War. The three great powers discussed the political and economic problems of Germany under the occupation. They also discussed the final frontiers of Poland. On July 17th, world-shaking news arrived. In the afternoon, Mr. Stimson called at my abode and lay before me a sheet of paper on which was written, Babies Satisfactorily Born. Japanese resistance, man by man, and 
conquer the country yard by yard might well require the loss of a million American lives and half that number of British or more. Now all this picture had vanished. In its place was the vision of the end of the whole war in one or two violent shocks. Before the declaration of the Poles on July 25th, Mr. Churchill came back in order to hear the results. Of course, nobody had any serious doubts as to those results. Although I do remember that some months before, Mr. Churchill had said to me that the British people had a curious way of showing their affection for people whom they thought had served them well by throwing them out at the first possible opportunity when an election came along, and he had quoted Disraeli and Lloyd George. However, on that morning, I don't think he or anybody else thought that the result of the election could be anything but a great conservative victory. It was thought to be a foregone conclusion. In fact, I believe that Stalin said to Mr. Churchill with a wink when he left, something which gave gave Mr. Churchill to understand that Stalin knew he'd gone back to fix the results. My wife met me and we dined quietly. I went to bed in the belief that the British people would wish me to continue my work. Thus, slumber. Just before dawn, I woke suddenly with a sharp stab of almost physical pain. A hitherto subconscious conviction that we were beaten broke forth and dominated my mind. The power to shape the future would be denied me. Churchill's defeat at the polls is overwhelming. Watching Churchill's reactions to the election results was his friend and fellow conservative, Lord Boothby. It should not be forgotten that in the 1945 election, Churchill had to bear the whole brunt, not only of his own mistakes in the war, and uh, there were quite a number, and some of them were inevitable and unavoidable but he had to bear the brunt, the whole brunt, of the misdeeds of the government before the war presided over successively by Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Neville Chase. A government that reduced a great country and a great empire from a position of absolute security and world power to the brink of total destruction within a decade. It took the Roman Empire 200 years of quite enjoyable decadence to achieve the same result. Many people all over the world were surprised, shocked, disappointed when Churchill lost this election in 45. But they have the wrong view of it. They're thinking of it as a contest between personalities, as if Winston Churchill was fighting Clement Attlee, who was the leader of the Labour Party. But of course, it wasn't like that at all. It was two great political parties who were fighting this conflict. And the fact was that the majority of the British electorate didn't want the Tories back again. They'd been there for many years before the war. There was a new spirit, and they felt that the Labour Party better embodied that spirit. It created the kind of slow social revolution we needed gave India independence, and it did something very important that really halted the spread of communism in Western Europe. It showed that you could have a left-wing government that was not a communist government. The indomitable old war horse has been turned out to pasture. He who had flashed magnificent defiance in the face of defeat. The subjugation of Poland. The doomed campaign in Norway. 
the annihilation of the Low Countries in Dunkirk. The fall of France. The catastrophe in Crete. The humiliating surrenders at Tobruk. Hong Kong. Singapore. He who had rallied his people when they stood alone, awaiting invasion and facing extinction from the sky and strangulation by sea. He who in history's darkest moment called upon his country to renounce the craven fear of being great. He who overcame all and led the island people to victory. On July 26, 1945, is dismissed from office. I tendered my resignation to the king and advised his majesty to send for Mr. Attlee. The decision of the British people has been recorded in the votes counted today. I have therefore laid down the charge which was placed upon me in darker times. It only remains for me to express to the British people, for whom I have acted in these perilous years, my profound gratitude for the unflinching, unswerving support which they have given me during my task, and for the many expressions of kindness which they have shown toward their servant. of events and if you will permit me I shall inscribe some of these words as my testament because I should like to be held accountable for them in years which I shall not see it is my earnest hope that pondering upon the past may give guidance in days to come enable a new generation to repair some of the errors of former years and thus govern in accordance with the needs and glory of man the awful unfolding scene of the future. American Broadcasting Company gratefully acknowledges the assistance of the British Broadcasting Corporation in the preparation of this series. <laughs>